Okay, well, let's go ahead. We're short of time, so we might as well use the time that we have. I'm Cole Harrison from Massachusetts Peace Action. I wanna welcome everyone here tonight to another Mass Peace Action webinar. Um, Mass Peace Action is a statewide peace and justice organization. Uh, we stand for nuclear disarmament and end to endless wars and cuts to the military budget. Um, tonight we are joined by uh, professor Jeff Sachs, who is a uh, professor of development economics from uh, Columbia. Uh, <clears throat> he's the university professor and di director of the Center for Sustainable Development and one of the world's leading experts on sustainable development, economic development, and the fight against poverty. Professor Sachs' last appearance for Mass Peace Action was in 2018 when he addressed our annual meeting. Um, welcome, Professor Sachs. Um, Good to be with you. We originally invited you tonight to talk about China because we are terribly concerned about the emergence of a no cold war with China. And we've been reading your pieces with interest, but I can't resist starting by asking you to speak uh, today about the piece you just posted on Afghanistan. Obviously the world's attention is riveted on the collapse of the Afghan government and drawing the, le the correct lessons from it and wonder what your thoughts are about what's happened. Uh, thanks very much, Cole, and uh, good evening to everybody. I see friends and uh, nice to be together with you. Uh, I, the point of my piece uh, is twofold. First, that uh, We've not been in Afghanistan for 20 years. Uh, we've been in Afghanistan for uh, at least 42 years uh, since uh, 1979. Uh, we started this whole morass, funded the Mujahideen, uh, indirectly created the Taliban, uh, indirectly created Al, Al Qaeda, uh, did it uh, as a typical harebrained CIA scheme to uh, destabilize the Soviet Union, and we've ended up destabilizing the world for a long time. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, first phase uh, from 79 through the Soviet uh, invasion, uh, the rise of the Taliban originally to 9-11 marked the first phase, uh, the second, uh, started with the invasion in uh, December 2001. And it's important for us to ask not only how did we create this calamity, which I think we are the principal authors of, uh, but how could you spend a trillion dollars uh, and get nothing out of it? Uh, and that is a fascinating question because it's, almost impossible to waste a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. Uh, we could have uh, created uh, a, a, a wealthy society many times over and uh, of course did nothing of the sort. So the second theme of uh, this piece today is where did that money go? And the answer is that uh, of the trillion that we spent, less than 2% went to economic development. 86% uh, went for the US military. Another large chunk went for the Afghan military. Uh, another large chunk went for drug uh, interdiction and so on. And under $20 billion went for economic development over 20 years something like $10 per person for uh, a uh, uh, billion a year, 20 million people, rough, roughly speaking, um, or two, 2 billion a year, I should, uh, no, sorry, a billion a year uh, for uh, the population. Tiny investments, we wasted almost everything on a militarized approach. Why? Uh, Basically, because uh, the American uh, military system does not care about the people uh, that are at the receiving end of an intervention. And that has always been true, uh, I'd say, you know, certainly from Vietnam onward. So I think that fundamentally, we operated in, in uh, Afghanistan with 
complete disdain of the Afghan people for 20 years. Uh, it was never, our, our leaders take great pride in uh, promoting the idea, we're not, uh, we're, we're not nation building, uh, as if that would be the most horrible thing in the world. But what it means, as uh, President Biden said it yesterday and has been repeated, and the Wall Street Journal chortled this uh, today, uh, we're not there because we care about uh, other people. That would be a waste of our money. Uh, we're there because of us. And that's what our politicians uh, need to tell us. And by the way, it's true. Uh, we never act as if we care about the other side. So it's not exactly a surprise that everything collapses uh, suddenly the way that it does. And for many of us uh, my age uh, and, and older, of course, we recall vividly uh, Saigon, we recall vividly countless other examples of this. There's nothing surprising in this at all. Um, and I can tell you, you know, as a uh, one of our country's leading development practitioners, uh, from the earliest days in 2002, 2003, I saw vividly how Washington could give a damn about any of this. And that was true, certainly in George W. Bush's time, but it was basically true all the way from then till now. Nobody gives a damn about Afghanistan and the Afghan people in some pretty basic fundamental way. Know it, get it, uh, and uh, this is uh, why the collapse comes uh, so uh, easily and so quickly. Uh, if you'll permit me, uh, let me just uh, actually pull up if I can get it. Just want to read you a couple of words uh, uh, from, I don't know if I can find it, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. Just great pride uh, in making clear, you know, that uh, Biden really blew it uh, and Biden doesn't understand. We're not there because of women and girls. We don't care about that. We don't care about nation building. We're there for our security. So let's get that straight. And Biden's really blown it. That view is really the Washington view. Uh, and so it could never work. It could never work. Not only because you put 98% of a trillion dollars for the wrong purposes, but even the 2% wasn't out of any care or desire to improve the situation. I'm not saying for every single person, obviously, in every single project. I'm saying the mindset that guides our country. Uh, and that was true in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Iraq, Syria. Libya, Afghanistan, you name it, we don't care as a country. Uh, and uh, it, it shows. And so it's debacle after debacle after debacle. So otherwise, I don't have any opinions about this. Uh, but uh, ba basically, <laughs> peace action is completely correct. How stupid these policies are. Uh, it's I hate to say it, but it's uh, pretty much bipartisan stupidity. Uh, there wasn't really, and by the way, this foreign policy of ours has been pretty much bipartisan stupidity, uh, at least as long as uh, I've been old enough to know, because it goes back to Lyndon Johnson after all. Uh, and uh, it's mind boggling uh, how all of these misadventures end up in the situation that we're in right now so predictably. So anyway, I'll stop the rant, but that was what today's piece is about. Uh, thanks, Professor Sachs. Most uh, enlightening and a very incisive critique of the disaster of U.S. foreign policy in so many places. I can't help but map that onto China. I do want to come, come over to China uh, and uh, 
you know, we are, um, con- you know, we say we're concerned about Taiwan. We say we're concerned about Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and so on. So how do you see that lack of care that, that you've described in U.S. policy, how do you see that connecting to the emerging, no, the emerging Cold War with China? First of all, uh, all of those who express a, a concern about these places, I, most, most of our politicians couldn't place them on a map and don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the first point. What we're trying to do very consciously, very crudely and crassly is uh, we're trying to uh, corner and insult China at every turn by taking a, an extraordinarily important, dangerous, crucial, complex relationship of the two most powerful countries of the world and uh, compressing it into uh, in, into uh, emotive phrases. So every time a U.S. diplomat uh, opens his or her mouth these days, the first words to a Chinese counterpart come out. So how's Xinjiang, Taiwan, and Hong Kong? Now, th- the reason why this is so absurd is that we have a thousand issues that are of crucial global significance to discuss with China. And we want to make clear that what we want to discuss with China is uh, China's sorest point, which is uh, the sense of vulnerability of outsiders interfering and dividing China. And those three places uh, are precisely uh, China's uh, biggest security concerns uh, internally. And our idea of diplomacy is to put them the highest in discussion possible, when instead we should be discussing how to keep peace in the world, nuclear disarmament rather than a new arms race, which is happening right now, cyber safety and security, climate change, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, other global financial stability, ending COVID-19, getting uh, vaccines to uh, a desperately waiting world, There are a thousand things we should be discussing with China, and we're not discussing any of them right now. Uh, In fact, the whole point of the foreign policy of this administration vis-a-vis China right now is to have no strategic dialogue, but only to issue a set of insults. That was true up until yesterday's uh, debacle in Kabul. So Blinken today called uh, Wang Yi, the uh, Chinese foreign minister, (laughs) Because uh, now we're in desperate situations, so we want China's help to make sure that our personnel get out uh, and to make sure that it isn't a worse disaster. So Blinken went begging today. But up until now, every word has been uh, about uh, American uh, really meddling and provocations on China's sorest issues. Why are we raising Taiwan at all right now? That, by the way, is one of the two or three potential flashpoints for nuclear war, the way that we're playing with that. Just to be clear, it's extremely dangerous. That's number one. Why are we saying there is a genocide in Xinjiang, which is absolutely not true? There are human rights abuses, certainly, But a genocide is a complete PR provocation. So my my point of all of this is, okay, let let me turn it around. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because uh, 
because China has been too successful in the last 20 years, uh, because uh, US policymakers decided about uh, five years ago that we somehow have to contain China's development because China has become too successful in technological advance. And the uh, word went out by Robert Blackwell uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations and then in official US foreign policy statements that uh, we are changing to a kind of containment strategy. And then everything has been geared towards this new idea that China is a threat. Uh, we have to stop it from gaining technology uh, and we have to provoke China and we have to, and, and Biden's idea, you know, uh, to uh, supersede Trump's is we have to do all the things Trump was doing, but we have to add allies around it. So Biden's enlightened view is we need a Cold War, but with allies. Uh, it's absolutely, absolutely uh, mind-bogglingly wrong. What we need right now is some cooperation, help the world to address really critical challenges from pandemics to climate change, uh, to uh, economic uh, emergencies, to unstable uh, war-ridden uh, regions. That's what we need. We need cooperation between the two big countries. And I'll, again, here's my, this is my second rant, but I'll just tell you at a personal level, I've been going to China for 41 years. Uh, I've trained lots of Chinese uh, students who are now uh, officials uh, throughout the government. I work with the Chinese academic colleagues uh, on many issues very fruitfully for decades. And I find the approach that we're taking so wrongheaded, so uh, incredibly misconceived and so dangerous that I'm frankly shocked by it uh, because it's so stupid that I never imagined we'd come to it so quickly and easily. So sorry to mince words on that one too, but uh, that that is uh, my main message. Yeah, it's just stunning how fast they've been able to turn public opinion in the United States <clears throat> to see China as an adversary or a competitor or an enemy. Uh, you know, competitor, better. yes, why not? Uh, on many things, uh, an enemy, this is crazy and incredibly dangerous because you make enemies, it becomes completely self-fulfilling. And that's what we're doing right now. And by the way, you know, what we're really doing is trying to kill, we think we're, uh, you know, going to kill China's progress by keeping semiconductor, advanced semiconductors away. And, you know, indeed they went out to try to kill Huawei uh, a couple of years ago without any basis whatsoever, except repeating, repeating endlessly. It's a threat, it's a danger. Uh, we can't allow 5G of uh, Huawei systems. And finally, they just cut off the line of, uh, of advanced uh, semiconductors uh, last year. And it's, it's really biting right now, but I'll make a prediction that uh, China's gonna be able to produce these semiconductors in a year or two or three, uh, we are spurring that advance quickly. And uh, I think, you know, people should analogize this to the idea in 1945, the United States thought, well, we'll have the nuclear monopoly for the next generation at least. Uh, and it didn't take uh, the Soviet Union uh, more than four years uh, to do what uh, all of the U.S. policymakers believed would be 15, 20, 25 years. And so we're playing a losing game the same way that it was obvious we were playing a losing game in, in uh, Afghanistan. I have to tell you, uh, I'm just not impressed with the intelligence. Uh, I mean, not, not only uh, obviously the ill will, but I'm really deeply uh, impressed by the ignorance in Washington. Uh, these people don't know what they're talking about. That's the bottom line. 
Pretty scary. I wonder if you could try to turn it around and envision a productive relationship with China. Um, let, take climate change, take COVID-19, or take, take you know, whatever specific issue you want to. And how should we be reaching out and collaborating? What do you envision? China is, uh, of course, a vast, uh, important, complex country and society uh, and civilization. And so we need a deep and uh, knowledge, knowledgeable and intensive and multifaceted relationship with China. We should be having regular meetings between U.S. officials and Chinese officials, U.S. academics and Chinese academics, cultural exchanges. China represents nearly 20% of the world population. Uh, it, uh, is, it is one of the great civilizations of Earth's history, of humanity's history. So at a government level, we should be having absolutely normal, regular consultations. God forbid they should Zoom with each other every few days. Uh, you don't even have to travel anymore. And Zoom is a wonderful thing, actually. Uh, it's also nice to meet people, but it's uh, in person. But Zoom is really nice that if the US and Chinese officials were actually talking about things, we'd get so far. But, you know, when Biden came in, he gave the order. We are not going to have a strategic dialogue with China. And I think, I, I don't know exactly the motivations. Uh, I don't know how much the administration believes its own rhetoric. Somehow, I doubt it. Uh, I think perhaps their main preoccupation is to be called weak by right-wing Republicans, uh, and that has been a standard modus operandi of uh, Democrats for uh, at least 60 years, uh, and a very dangerous one because the Democrats can go pretty far to the right, and as far as they go, the Republicans can go even farther to the right. Uh, and so it, it, you never can uh, satisfy uh, our yelping, barking, nasty, stupid, ignorant right wing in this country. Uh, but the Democrats try. So I'm not sure what it is that motivates the administration exactly. But they gave the instruction, we're not going to have a dialogue with China. Well, so your question is an excellent one. And the answer is all of those things. We should be having regular discussions on climate change, regular discussions on macroeconomics, regular discussions uh, on COVID-19. By the way, if you have a look, uh, while we have uh, 200,000 cases a day of Delta right now, China has uh, about 20, not 20,000, about 20. Uh, they had an outbreak that reached 17 provinces and they got it under control, just as they had kept uh, COVID under control for the past two years. Uh, we have had, I haven't looked at the most recent number, 630,000 deaths. I, I may be out of date. I should, should know today's number, but China has had about 4,000. And we've not had a serious discussion with them. How did you do that? What are you doing? I know we haven't because I'm involved in this issue. And we're too stupid to discuss this with them. And when I write about it, I'm accused of listening to China's lies and blah, 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 because this country doesn't want to learn anything from anybody else. But China has really done an excellent job of containing this outbreak. And I'd like to understand it better, frankly. And our policymakers should understand it better. And we don't even try. So that's one. 
we should be sitting down with China and talking about the vaccines. And we should be helping China, by the way, to produce mRNA vaccines and sharing the information because we want a world supply. And uh, all our selfishness only means more variants that we're going to face and in more of a pandemic. So again, we're so stupid because this is all completely predictable, but we're not sitting down with China. We're in vaccine nationalism. Who can send to whom and when? By the way, we're barely supplying any vaccines to the rest of the world. And now with the new boosters, even less than we thought we were going to be uh, providing. So we should be talking about that. Oh, it's incredible, by the way. I speak with my Chinese counterparts in development and in academia and in discussing with professionals about COVID. And the discussions are fruitful, important, interesting, different perspectives, good knowledge, many things to discuss, but, you know, that would be grown up. Thank you. Well, if I could just close with this question, what can um, Americans that see a different perspective on this do to turn this dialogue around? I know we're not gonna turn it around in a day, but where's, yeah. where's the weak spot of the establishment's thought process and where can we you know, uh, get, get get break through the clutter. You know, we, as uh, I'm sure that almost all of us or all of us uh, vote Democratic and, and uh, are, uh, you know, friendly to this administration, as I am, by the way. Uh, and, uh, you know, Janet Yellen is, I think, the best Treasury Secretary we've had, uh, at, perhaps since uh, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and uh, she was my teacher uh, of macroeconomics 48 years ago at Harvard. Uh, and I loved her then as a teacher and adore her and admire her. So we have a, a terrific treasury secretary. And what, uh, what Biden is trying to do domestically uh, with the, uh, the, the new budget package that uh, Bernie has uh, uh, just uh, uh, brought through the budget resolution, the three and a half trillion dollars is really good. It's really important. Uh, so we have a very decent president and we have uh, an extremely important domestic, uh, uh, domestic agenda. And what we should do is help our friends understand you're on the wrong track. We don't want a Cold War. We're too unstable for a Cold War. You can't unite the country with the Cold War, which may be some of the thinking, by the way. Uh, you can't uh, buy off the right wing with the Cold War. I mean, just we, to interject, the, you know, the liberals, like we have Ed Markey, we have Jim McGovern, they say that we're not, I'm not in favor of a Cold War. Uh, we are collaborating with China on climate, but they really aren't supporting it. Um, but by the way, what we can say to them, because they are our friends, and they do listen, and this is not because of the weight of our votes, uh, it's because we're friends and they know it, is it's not good enough to say, yeah, we're uh, cooperating on climate, but on nothing else. <laughs> it's it's a nonsense. I know it. You know, I know it practically because there's work to be done. You can't just say, "Well, we're going to be uh, we're going to be cooperative on this, but we're going to be absolutely obnoxious on all the rest," and think that uh, this is going to work. How clever is that? Yeah, we we have to we have to <clears throat> say to Marky and others, please. We need dialogue between the two countries. And we really need some, some global cooperation, not just on climate, though that's essential. <laughs> we now obviously need it on Afghanistan. We need it on a whole host. We need it on COVID. We need normal relations 
So stop putting Xinjiang, Taiwan, and Hong Kong at the center of our relations with China. They're somewhere on the list, maybe 90th. But what's really on our list is actually getting along so that we can solve crucial global problems together. And our friends need to hear that and need to hear how completely unimpressive it is what, what our diplomats have been doing. And I think maybe the last couple of days have been sobering enough that they'll stop this kind of approach because <clears throat> it's too dangerous what they're doing. You'd like to think so, wouldn't you? Well, on I, that cheery note, I better let you go. I know you have a time commitment. Uh, Professor Sachs, I appreciate your joining us very much. Can, can I say to you, Cole, and like everybody, to th thank you for Peace Action. Thank you for what you do. It's extremely important, really important right now. Uh, you're the rational voice in this country. So uh, count on me if I can help. Sometimes my best help is to shut up. You can tell me that. But sometimes uh, it's uh, to help in other ways. Uh, but please keep doing what you're doing and speak to the politicians that you're close with. We need a safer approach right now. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. Th thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Uh, Andrew, if you could take me off a of spotlight. So uh, Professor Sachs had a time commitment tonight, so he wasn't able to stay and take questions from attendees. And we apologize for that because we always like to include that in our discussions. Um, but we do have a few minutes now that we can talk among ourselves. Um, if anyone would like to bring something up, we can uh, throw it around a little bit. Uh, so go ahead and... Um, if you would like to speak up, uh, you can use the response, uh, sorry, reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and, and raise your hand, your virtual hand. Uh, let me go first to Michael Hoey. The thing I've been hearing about is theft of intellectual property that Huawei tapped into Costco's computers and uh, stole blueprints and the same thing with uh, some of the Pentagon suppliers with the F-35 and the drones and that that's one of the reasons and I don't know if that's just a rumor or if there's any validity to the idea that um, we're kind of a, we have people that are upset because of the intellectual property they that's to my understanding part of the trade agreements a really big part of the trade agreement is the right to sue um, the ISDS uh, process and the intellectual property is at the top of the list. So that, that may just be false. I don't know. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I sure don't have an answer to that, but I will say that we're always hearing about uh, China's offenses when it comes to, you know, planting bugs inside of the uh, technology or, um, or, or uh, cyber cyber attacks, but we never hear about the ones that America does. So I'm, I'm automatically suspicious that we're getting one side of the story. We know for sure that US, that the NSA has um, tentacles into the US high tech companies, the, the uh, Googles and Amazons and all of them. Um, but, but it's never bracketed the same way, you know, as, as the complaints of alleged Chinese government uh, whole um, backdoors into their company's technology. So I, <clears throat> we do need better information on that. Let me go to Renee Sigerson. Okay, I'm on I think I'm un unmuted, correct? Yes. Um, it's too bad uh, uh, Professor Sachs had to leave because I would have liked to have invited him to participate in the Schiller Institute uh, webcasts that have been going on every Saturday, uh, where many, uh, many of them, uh, leading Chinese and Russian and other international representatives have spoken. And I, while I agree with him completely on this complacency and lack of compassion, which has been uh, permeated into American society, which I don't think is natural to Americans, but is it a kind of like, we only care about the United States. 
while I, while I do absolutely agree that that's a problem, I think people need to know more about the solutions that the Schiller Institute and related organizations have been fighting for for 50 years, in which probably every single person who's on this um, screen probably has heard of. So just two quick things, because I know a lot of people are going to want to talk. Number one, um, just to show you, in 2014, we put out this report. It probably looks backwards what you're, see what you're seeing it. It's called The New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge. And it's about the breakthrough in China policy, which really has transformed the opportunity for the entire world to benefit from what is called peace through economic development. That option is on the table and exists. And it's been very much under attack, what they're, what they're doing. It has to do with the vast investments that they're making in Africa and other locations around the world to uplift the economic conditions of people everywhere to dry out these war zones, which is why this, this leaving of Afghanistan is a tremendous opportunity. Dry out the war zones by investing in real economic development, which like the Marshall Plan would only be of benefit to our economy, not a drain on our economy, and this can be proven. And I want to say one other thing, and I, this is very controversial. I hope, Cole, that you don't mind controversy. But I'm going to say one thing because I have to say it because I have to be honest. I've been a political organizer for 50 years, and I have to be honest, uh, which is that people would have a much better understanding of how this would work if they would join with us, yourself included, to end the demonization and mischaracterization of the life's work of Lyndon LaRouche. Because Mr. LaRouche was attacked precisely because he raised these issues decades ago. And smart uh, jurists in Boston, Massachusetts, were actually the ones who said that the government operation to have him fra framed up and thrown in jail was a, uh, a fraud, a complete political fraud. So in the good tradition of the courageous Boston people who saw through the frame up of Lyndon LaRouche, I would urge you to check out his writings, things like this wonderful report from Executive Intelligence Review, and become familiar with what the Chinese and the Russians, it's not just the Chinese, the Russians are involved with them, have been doing to get this policy and which both political party leaderships don't want the people of this country to know about. I'll leave it at that. I know I've sort of dropped a little bit of a time of a bombshell there, but I think, I think that you can't have a reasonable discussion about what to do about the world unless you tell the truth these days. And I'm open to answering if anybody wants to know more about that, I'm happy to help you to find out. Okay, thanks, Renee. Peter Metz. Oh, <clears throat> Cole, I, I, I would have loved to ask Jeffrey Sachs, um, are the Chinese interested in this dialogue? What indication do we have that they'll dialogue with us in the way that he wants? Well, I, do you have any I, indication? I, well, I'm not going to answer for him, but in the announcement for this event, I, we linked to three of, of Professor Sachs' articles. And the first one was his evaluation of, this was back in February, of a speech that was given by Xi Jinping in which he laid out four goals, uh, macroeconomic policy coordination, peaceful coexistence, win-win cooperation, uh, uh, close the gap between the developing and the developed countries, and we should come together against global challenges. So certainly uh, from that uh, speech, he was certainly offering a cooperative relationship. Uh, I'm sure there might be well, views on this, whatever, but I don't mean to answer the questions. Well, I wasn't that, really intending to, but yeah. Um, well, that just exposes my ignorance. I'm not aware of that at all. I think the American public isn't aware of that. Yeah. We need to make more people aware that um, when, when our the US, adversaries when have the US left media, when, the U, when the U.S. government and the media decide a country is an enemy, they never report the positions of that country's leaders accurately or clearly. That's, that's a given. That's a standard operating procedure for them, I'm afraid. Uh, next up is Brian Campbell. Brian. Yeah, hello. Brian Campbell, um, I guess I'm just going to push back a bit on, um, on genocide. 
if ABC News says there's genocide in China, is that fake news or is that real? You know, and ABC is not the only one to say there's genocide going on in China. And the way they define it is that there's forced sterilization. Okay, and the Chinese government itself wants to reduce the Uyghur population. Is that, is that genocide? Well, I don't know. I can't resist. Maybe in the modern sense of the word, it's not genocide. I can't resist but make, to make a comment, and I, I have not been to Xinjiang, and I certainly am not an expert on this, um, but I do know that over the many years that China had a one-child child policy, it did not apply that policy to the Uyghurs or the other uh, uh, ethnic minorities. So their population increased during that time. So I don't know whether there have been certain instances of sterilization as they allege, but it doesn't seem entirely credible to me that that's the overall essence of Chinese uh, demographic policy in, in Xinjiang. But uh, I think we need to learn learn more. But you know, I'll just say I suspect that this whole well, this is this is addressed against the Uyghur minority. Yeah, I know about the one China policy, and that was for everybody. That seemed fair. But it wasn't. But this, it, the Uyghurs it were wasn't. exempt. The Uyghurs okay. were exempted from it. It was for the the majority ethnic group, which are the Han Chinese. But the Uyghurs were not subject to the one child one child policy. Okay. Well, to so me, that, like genocide applies to a minority, like the Jews under the Nazis. Right. Right. That's the claim. Yep. So to me, this is genocide. But maybe to other people, like um, the doctor who was just speaking, it's not. And I don't understand that. And again, right, China is, is um, shipping fentanyl to us, only they do it through online synthetic drug networks now. They banned fentanyl exports back in 2019. But I don't see any homeless. I still see the homeless out there. I know that they get that there's fentanyl deaths happening in Massachusetts right now. And it all links back to China. And I'm sorry, but NPR, maybe they're fake news. I don't know. Maybe they're saying the wrong thing. And um, then what about organ, organ harvesting from um, detainees in China? A billion dollar a year business. You know, um, I've heard some other things about that, but um, that's just NBC News reporting on that. And then what happened with the umbrella revolution and in, in, uh, in the way that it was suppressed in Hong Kong? I mean, we're dealing with a dictator, a, a military dictatorship in China. And I'm telling you, it's going to it's going to take the U.S. standing up to them. But we don't have a supply base. Everything comes from China now. So maybe we should kowtow. I don't know. Well, Brian, I'll just say two things. One is I'll just put in the chat the article that Jeff Sachs wrote about the uh, Uyghur alleged genocide. And so uh, you might look at that for an alternative perspective. As for the umbrellas and so forth, I, what I would say is that uh, as, as Professor Sachs, he, he named Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang, you have to realize that China is still recovering from colonialism. Those, you know, China was broken up by Western powers. And those, it is extremely insecure about hang, hanging on to its entire country. Of course, Hong Kong was retained as a British colony until what, the 90s? And uh, I think Tibet I, would disagree uh, with your explanation. Well, I'm, I'm not, there's always two sides to every story. I'm just saying that the national unity of China. Well, is, Dalai Lama is, doesn't is matter good. anymore. Okay, so let me call the next person, which is Louise. Okay. Okay, um, what I wanted to. Uh, is an observation of that one of the issues that would be really helpful to have a dialogue with China on is um, things that 
that to contribute to uh, to disruption in the world. And there's one, it has to do with animals. And it's like, there's part of what they're doing and there's part of what uh, the West is doing, which are equally culpable. Um, in that in China, the, the meat markets do um, boil um, exotic animals, domestic animals. And, and, you know, there's some really good evidence that that's where the latest, some of the pandemics happen. So that seems culturally awful. But then in this neck of the woods, it's more like factory farming, keeping animals like they were mushrooms and that they're awful conditions. And that again, it breeds, uh, it, it breeds disease. Um, so that would be an interesting thing to talk to China about, uh, to have a dialogue with is how those two things contribute to uh, what's happening to destroy the climate. And that there are both um, negatives, one on their side and one on, on the West. And it doesn't help the animals at all. Great, okay, thank you. Yael, Yael Danielli. Um, okay, hi, I think that there was one of the intervention that sort of almost assumed that China must be a good one, a good, wonderful place in order for the United States to, to negotiate or to have a dialogue with. That's not what diplomacy is about. Uh, we are not angels, they are not angels. Uh, but the, I think Jeffrey was coming from the point of view of how together we can help the world. And uh, with reg regarding the SDGs at the United Nations, we can't do it alone. And so I, I just thought I'd place, place that in. I, I have visited China. There, there are horrible things there and there are absolutely wonderful things there. Uh, and I've worked with Chinese people. Um, at the UN, so, uh, but, but the issue is not whether we deal only with people like us. It, it, it never, it simply not, never is. Right, thank you. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, thank you everyone. I'm just gonna announce our coming events. Uh, we have three webinars on le uh, next week. <clears throat> On Tuesday, we have the St. Vincent nurses strike. You know, the nurses have been on strike in St. Vincent's Hospital in Worcester for, gosh, it seems like three months, maybe. Forget exactly, but a terribly long time. So we're gonna hear from some of the mass nurses, uh, leaders and representatives about what's going on with that struggle. On Wednesday, we have, oh, wait a minute. Huh? That one was, I'm sorry, that one was on Monday. On Tuesday, we have, uh, Time to draft women to a call to end the selective service system for everyone. As you may know, there are calls to uh, make women register for the draft as well as men. Uh, and so this is a call to end selective service. Um, and third is we have another webinar on China on Thursday of next week with two scholars. This is more of a historical view looking at US-China relations over a hundred years and. And, and particularly over the last 50 years. So I think everyone here will find that interesting. Um, so I wanna thank you for coming out tonight and sorry we had an abbreviated discussion, but hopefully it was a, a good one and an interesting one. Good night. And good luck.